episode 143. The Minister of Magic will never employ Harry Potter, said Umbridge, her voice rising furiously. There may well be a new Minister of Magic by the time Potter is ready to join, shouted Professor McGonagall. Ah! shrieked Professor Umbridge, pointing a stubby finger at McGonagall. Yes, 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 of course! That's what you want, isn't it, Minerva McGonagall? You want Cornelius Fudge replaced by Albus Dumbledore. You think you'll be where I am, don't you? Senior and your secretary to the minister and headmistress to boot. You are raving, said Professor McGonagall, superbly disdainful. Potter. That concludes our career consultation. Harry swung his bag over his shoulder and hurried out of the room, not daring to look at Umbridge. He could hear her and Professor McGonagall continuing to shout at each other all the way back along the corridor. (sighs) Professor Umbridge was still breathing as though she had just run a race when she strode into their defense against the dark arts lesson that afternoon. I hope you've thought better of what you're planning to do, Harry, Hermione whispered, the moment they had opened their books to Chapter 34, Non-Retaliation and Negotiation. Umbridge looks like she's in a really bad mood already. Every now and then, Umbridge shot glowering looks at Harry, who kept his head down, staring at defensive magical theory, his eyes unfocused, thinking. He could just imagine Professor McGonagall's reaction if he were caught trespassing in Professor Umbridge's office mere hours after she had vouched for him. There was nothing to stop him simply going back to Gryffindor Tower and hoping that sometime during the next summer holiday he would have a chance to ask Sirius about that scene he had witnessed in the Pensieve. Nothing, except that the thought of taking this sensible course of action made him feel as though a lead weight had dropped into his stomach. And then there was the matter of Fred and George, whose diversion was already planned, not to mention the knife Sirius had given him, which was currently residing in his school bag along with his father's old invisibility cloak. But the fact remained that if he were caught, Dumbledore sacrificed himself to keep you in school, Harry, whispered Hermione, raising her book to hide her face from Umbridge. And if you get thrown out today, it will all have been for nothing. He could abandon the plan and simply learn to live with the memory of what his father had done on a summer's day more than 20 years ago. And then he remembered Sirius in the fire, upstairs in the Gryffindor common room. You're less like your father than I thought. The risk would have been what made it fun for James. But did he want to be like his father anymore? Harry, don't do it. Please, don't do it, Hermione said in anguished tones as the bell rang at the end of the class. He did not answer. He did not know what to do. Ron seemed determined to give neither his opinion nor his advice. He would not look at Harry, though... When Hermione opened her mouth to try dissuading Harry some more, he said in a low voice, Give it a rest, okay? He can make up his own mind. Harry's heart beat very fast as he left the classroom. He was halfway along the corridor outside when he heard the unmistakable sounds of a diversion going off in the distance. There were screams and yells reverberating from somewhere above them. People exiting the classrooms all around Harry were stopped in their tracks and looking up at the ceiling fearfully. Then Umbridge came pelting out of her classroom as fast as her short legs would carry her. Pulling out her wand, she hurried off in the opposite direction. It was now or never. Harry, please, said Hermione weakly. But he had made up his mind. Hitching his bags more securely onto his shoulder, he set off at a run, weaving in and out of students, now hurrying in the opposite direction, off to see what all the fuss was about in the east wing. Harry reached the corridor where Umbridge's office was situated and found it deserted. 
dashing behind a large suit of armor whose helmet creaked around to watch him, he pulled open his bag, seized Sirius's knife, and donned the invisibility cloak. He then crept slowly and carefully back out from behind the suit of armor and along the corridor until he reached Umbridge's door. He inserted the blade of the magical knife into the crack around it and moved it gently up and down, then withdrew it. There was a tiny click, and the door swung open. He ducked inside the office, closed the door quickly behind him, and looked around. It was empty. Nothing was moving except the horrible kittens on the plates, continuing to frolic on the wall above the confiscated broomsticks. Harry pulled off his cloak, and striding over to the fireplace, found what he was looking for within seconds, a small box containing glittering flu powder. He crouched down in front of the empty grate, his hands shaking. He had never done this before, though he knew how it must work. Sticking his head into the fireplace, he took a large pinch of powder and dropped it onto the logs stacked neatly beneath him. They exploded at once into emerald green flames. Number 12, Grimmauld Place, Harry said loudly and clearly. It was one of the most curious sensations he had ever experienced. He had traveled by flu powder before, of course, but then it had been his entire body that had spun around and around in the flames through the network of wizarding fireplaces that stretched all over the country. This time, his knees remained firm upon the cold floor of Umbridge's office, and only his head hurtled through the emerald fire. And then, abruptly as it had begun, the spinning stopped. Feeling rather sick, and as though he was wearing an exceptionally hot muffler around his head, Harry opened his eyes to find that he was looking up out of the kitchen fireplace at the long wooden table, where a man sat, poring over a piece of parchment. Sirius? The man jumped and looked around. It was not Sirius, but Lupin. Harry, he said, looking thoroughly shocked. What are you? What's happened? Is everything all right? Yeah, said Harry. I just wondered, I mean, I just fancied a, a chat with Sirius. I'll call him, said Lupin, getting to his feet, still looking perplexed. He went upstairs to look for Creature. He seems to be hiding in the attic again and Harry saw Lupin hurry out of the kitchen. Now he was left with nothing to look at but the chair and table legs. He wondered why Sirius had never mentioned how very uncomfortable it was to speak out of the fire. His knees were already objecting painfully to their prolonged contact with Umbridge's hard stone floor. Lupin returned with Sirius at his heels moments later. What is it? said Sirius urgently, sweeping his long dark hair out of his eyes and dropping to the ground in front of the fire, so that he and Harry were on a level. Lupin knelt down too, looking very concerned. Are you all right? Do you need help? No, said Harry, it's nothing like that. I, I just wanted to talk about my dad. They exchanged a look of great surprise, but Harry did not have time to feel awkward or embarrassed. His knees were becoming sorer by the second, and he guessed that five minutes had already passed from the start of the diversion. George had only guaranteed him twenty. He therefore plunged immediately into the story of what he had seen in the pensive. When he had finished, neither Sirius nor Lupin spoke for a moment. Then Lupin said quietly, "'I wouldn't like to judge your father on what you saw there, Harry. He was only fifteen. I'm 15, said Harry, heatedly. Look, Harry, said Sirius placatingly, James and Snape hated each other from the moment they set eyes on each other. It was just one of those things. You can understand that, can't you? I think James was everything Snape wanted to be. He was popular, he was good at Quidditch, good at pretty much everything. And Snape was just this little oddball who was up to his eyes in the dark arts. And James, whatever else he may have appeared to you, Harry, always hated the dark arts.'